While Giordani never set out to grow cane, he just wanted a farm. Now, after nine years, he's joined Catalyst, inspired by what his neighbours were doing. We're not generational farmers, so we chose to, to come onto the land. Um, and I saw real benefits in it. I think that uh, obviously for us to remain viable and be viable into the future, um, we need to take advantage of every, every opportunity that's out there. The, the first trials that I saw were legume trials um, and fallow ground. Um, and once again, that was a sort of a combination by um, HCPSL and terrain and the likes of those people. Um, and some of my, my neighbours, the Zardas were, were in particular, were, were out there sort of one of the one of the first ones to implement um, legume crops in their fallows. I'd moved down the um, down the path of the EM mapping and obviously um, uh, variable rate of, of amelians, in particular gypsum, um, because we've got sodic issues on one of our farms. Um, through that, obviously, the same people I were dealing with were the people that were in Catalyst and, and dealing, obviously, some with my neighbours and also um, heavily involved in, in, in getting these projects up and running. So I actually approached them and said, could I use one of the things that I was doing as a, a project for Catalyst? And they said, yeah, absolutely. Mario Racanello spent 10 years contracting in the Burdekin and leasing cane properties before returning to the family farm 20 years ago. Confronted by depleted soils and escalating fertiliser costs, he invested in his soil. My dad actually um, got this block in a ballot and uh, he cleared it all and put it under cattle and he was growing bananas. But he, he originally had the idea of what they used to do in Italy. Um, they used to lock all the cattle up during winter and uh, collect all the manure and make mulch out of it and fertiliser. He originally had a, feed, a feedlot set up here. We had 150 head of cattle locked up in a feedlot. We were feeding them and collecting all the manure and we were just spreading pure effluent on the bananas. As the years went on, you know, you're just buying fertiliser out of a bag and you're putting it on, you're putting it on. And the only ways in the back of my mind was what my dad had in his heart and in his mind of what to do with soil health and that. And just on a project catalyst trip to Hamilton Island, it actually was, um, ran into a bloke by the name of Gavin Kay and uh, we got talking and talking and um, he just told me a simpler way of doing it and uh, with him and uh, through Kim Cruz um, we got involved in a um, in the biofert production side of things and uh, yeah just sort of snowballed from there. Since 1949 Wayne Scoogle has lived and breathed farming. His father also received land through the ballot and liked to try new things. Wayne inherited the family business, which he believes is no longer financially viable. My daughter's an accountant on the Mareeba Shire, and my son is a, works on the ground out at Qantas in Cairns. No interest in farming? Oh yes, he went to Ag College in the Burdekin. He came home onto the farm, <coughs> the money dropped out of it, there was nothing left to share. So he got an opportunity to get an income of his own and he's been there for 15 years. The farm won't go on because it's too small. How many acres? At the moment, 150. Not all of it's mine, some of it's leased. The farm was split following illness years ago, but it hasn't dampened Wayne's interest in trials. I started with this compost in 2004. I was the first person to use a large quantity of it uh, when it was first made. Then it became unavailable due to problems at their plant. And uh, a few years ago, my neighbour found out that it was available again and we got back into it. Where we did the original trials with it, there was a trial done between BSES and the company CETA that owned it at the time and the results were excellent, but nobody ever took it up. I did some trials in 2004 on my own, and I never fertilised that land for four years. I got four crops off it before I, there was a necessity to put uh, artificial fertiliser back on it. An early adopter of GPS and controlled traffic, Mario continues to innovate due to results. Well, one year there in 2010-11, whenever it was that wet year, 
I was the only person in our group that shifted all his plant cane. Everyone else had plant cane standover. And all I put it down to was we're on controlled traffic lanes. But even now, like after 10 years, we'll go into a fifth return paddock and the root zone area is uncompacted. Your wheel space is compacted, but you've got that hole stool and that is untouched and it, it is still soft after five to six years. So the EM map obviously um, goes through, it gives us a soil profile. It highlights, to me, it highlights um, the areas that we believe to be sodic. Um, we then go back and do take a soil sample from there. Generally, that soil sample will verify what we think, which is, is that it's sodic. And obviously, the soil test also then um, gives you a recommendation on how to, how to address that issue. Generally, it was three tonne of gypsum per the hectare. Now, what we found is, is that when we were applying three tonne blanket gypsum across the paddock, um, it, was doing, it was having no effect. We were wasting our time and our money by just blanket um, applying three tonne of gypsum across the paddock. Then through conversations with, um, with some agronomists with HCPSL and, and, and the likes, um, we, we decided to give this a trial. So basically to concentrate the gypsum where the sodic patches were. So HCPSL then do up what's called a prescription. Um, in that prescription, I then plug that into my GPS, which then connects to my mud spreader or my spreader which is variable rate, so the spreader and the GPS talk to each other. So in very layman terms, I, I go in the paddock, I'm just a passenger, I push the button. Um, the, the GPS drives the tractor and as it goes through the paddock, when it gets to those spots, it actually applies a heavier rate of gypsum um, than it would where it's not required. How I got involved with Catalyst, a uh, young lady in Tully at Trap, Carissa Rickson, said to me, would I be interested in doing a compost trial at very variable rates? And because I'd had a lot to do with Carissa in her earlier jobs, I agreed to it, and we're in the middle of doing that now. First it was dry as a bone, then it got drowned. This was while it was still very small plant cane, and the, the result was not that well, you wouldn't even call it good, it was poor. Wayne has been successful before, one of the first to trial chemicals to control grubs. When uh, a neighbour and I were the first to use, do trials with Confidor in the, in the bad grub times, and um, on 80 acres of red volcanic soil, the year the grubs were really bad, I got 1,100 tonne to the mill. I treated and replanted, and the next year I got 3,300 tonne. And, and that shows it's a good idea to get outside the square. Different chemical uses, safer chemicals, chemicals that are more effective. Um, you'll get the argument, oh, the new chemical's too expensive, but when one application of that particular chemical that works 100% without any runoff whatsoever, um, and it's its cost is $100 a hectare, three applications of a different, the old style idea was $150 a hectare. It's fairly obvious which one you use. Through a network of growers, Mario has been able to work out a more efficient way to make and use BioFert. We've got funding to run the uh, numbers through um, terrain. On, on, for, the, for another year as well. So that'll bring it into our fifth year. Um, we, start, we didn't start on plant cane, we started on first return cane and uh, we just finished cutting our fourth return cane and it averaged around 100 tonne per hectare, I think. And uh, I've got the results there, but it was around about the 14 tonnes of sugar per hectare. They say no more than 6%, but I'm up to 50%. I'm putting it on 50% um, of biofert and 50% of water but I have not had any scalding of the leaves and I put it down to the fact that I'm putting out 700 litres of, of liquid per hectare. So I'm not like putting out 200 litres where the uh, dilution rate would probably be stronger. So we started off a little bit at a time, but uh, lower percentages. But yeah, as we got on, I just tried going higher and higher because I just didn't want to do more passes because more passes meant more cost. 
So I've just tried to get the passes down to one or two passes. For wool, increasing rates of gypsum up to eight ton per hectares on sodic ground produces results. It was the first time in that paddock where we'd planted it and we'd got a consistent yield across the paddock. The cane visually looked the same from one end to the other, which it never had before. And obviously harvesting confirmed that, yeah, the yield was all there. It didn't matter where we were cutting, um, the yield was consistent throughout the paddock. I'd like to verify what we're doing. Obviously, the first and biggest issue for me is I need to see the effects on farm or, in, or on ground, right? So in yield, I, I need to see my yield going up. That's one thing that, that we've sort of focused on is, is production, is to make sure that our yield is, is obviously up there. Generally, when people are getting out, they tend to let their farms run down. So um, when we bought them, the farms have always been underproducing, and it's been a big thing to me, as I said, to remain viable. You've really um, got to be maximising what you've got, um, not raping and pillaging it either. It, it had to be sustainable, it had to be there for the future, it had to be there for the next generation, my kids, if they choose to come onto the farm. With Wayne's compost trialer in its early phase, 2018 has shown improved conditions for a different result. We found with the compost, when it rains on it, it sets like a skin over the top of it and it does not move anywhere, it just stays there. The water will run over the top of it rather than take it away. There's calcium, there's organic, a lot of organic matter which helps with your organic carbons. Um, the, the calcium in it helps you with your pH and the fact that it's loosening the soil up. I describe it as a soil ameliorant, and not a fertiliser. Ten tonne of compost has got the, roughly the equivalent, equivalent calcium to a tonne of lime. We're doing uh, chromatology of the soil. Now that's a, a, a way of testing the soil to see if your uh, organic material is growing, your uh, biology is growing in the soil and from the beginning of the uh, trial we started we done chromatology and you could see there was no mineralization and very little biology in the soil, active biology in the soil. And now after three years of uh, chromos, we can actually see the biology's living and the mineralization is happening. We've still got a long way to go. Um, realistically, what I'd like to see is, and, and they're moving down that path, is now yield monitoring through the harvesting system or a combination, so EM mapping, yield monitoring, so getting all that information back to us as growers um, and for people like myself, um, you may then start to move down the path of variable rate fertiliser application. It's time for Mario to determine whether the capital costs of setting up a biofert plant to expand the system across his farm will be sustainable in the long term. Proven that we can reduce our nitrogen and add biofert but to do it on a full-scale uh, production side of things for my size farm, I'm going to have to sit down and do the economics because it's going to be another man, I've got to employ another man. At the moment, I'm growing 35 to 40,000 tonne by myself and I haven't got time to produce biofert and put it out. So that'll be another man involved. If we're in an irrigation system, I wouldn't have hesitated one little bit. I would have set it up and I'd be pumping this stuff constantly through our irrigation water. Here in Tully, we don't irrigate, um, so yeah, we have to apply it by tractor and the tank and the applicator, and uh, yeah, that, which does take a lot of time. Project Catalyst, for me, has, um, has brought a group of farmers together who think outside the square. Now, if you talked if you were a Project Catalyst farmer and you went to the everyday pub in town and spoke the way you were, they'd all look like you were like weird. We get together with Project Catalyst and um, we talk about some stupid things, but everybody's got a keen ear to listen because no idea in Project Catalyst is stupid. 